Hello, everybody. Hope everyone can hear me all right. Uh, welcome to Permaculture 101, Resilient and Regenerative Design. And we are uh, really, really happy to have Jessica Robertson from Wildcraft Permaculture with us today. Um, if you have done any of the previous Signal Boost webinars, you will probably uh, recognize myself. Uh, I'm Kelsey Nichols from Reforest London. Um, so actually, Jess, if you want to go to the next slide. So yeah, we're so happy to have Jessica join us again. She was with us a few months ago for a fruit tree care workshop. Um, and now it's next one, Permaculture 101. Um, so if you're not familiar with uh, Signal Boost and, and this program of, of webinars, um, so I'm from Reforest London. We're a, a local charity in London that plants trees and gives trees away. And we're all about enhancing the environmental and human health of the forest city through the benefits of trees. Um, less people are familiar with the fact that we are also the founders of the new Westminster Pond Center for Environment and Sustainability. Um, so it's a huge project, it's very exciting, and we're renovating some old buildings to um, offer all kinds of environmental um, services and programming. And so the Signal Boost Initiative is an educational program where um, we're going to be dramatically increasing the number of um, educational events and volunteer training sessions that are available in London. Um, so ultimately, the events will take place at the Westminster Pond Center, um, but in the meantime, they are taking place online during the shutdown. Um, so we're able to offer this webinar today. So I will just be in the background moderating. Um, I'll also be monitoring for questions and things like that. Um, actually, if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, you're all muted. You should have the ability to unmute, but um, for the most part, if you can stay muted, that will avoid any background noise. Um, and then we are recording this session, so if you miss any of it or, or can't stay the whole time, um, in a few days you'll get it emailed and you can watch it again. Um, and if you ever have any questions, ask them at any time in the question box and uh, we'll probably get to them as we go. All right, with that, I will turn off my camera and welcome Jessica. So thank you very much for being here. Hi. Um, so uh, so uh, for some reason, my camera's not working, or I would pop in and say hi so you can put a, a face to my name. But um, uh, I'm Jessica Robertson with Wildcraft Permaculture. Um, this will just be a short intro to permaculture. And then uh, we are going to do a full day permaculture workshop at the end of July. Um, if, you are, if your interest has peaked today, then um, please join us then and you can dive into it a little more deeply. Um, or there's also some uh, uh, two-week intensive permaculture design courses that are going to be coming up later in the year uh, that I'm, I'm not teaching, but colleagues are, if you get really excited about it and you really want to dive in head first. Um, I can uh, share that information later. I didn't think to include it. Um, so, um, Permaculture got me really excited when I first learned about it um, because it is about taking responsibility for your own existence. And it, I had been in sustainability um, work and, and that mindset and world for a long time, but there was all, always a lot of um, uh, blame and, uh, you know, well, I'm doing my part and other people aren't. Um, I like this one of my colleagues when I worked for an architecture firm in Edmonton for a while and one of my colleagues brought me this cartoon one day Dogbert the green consultant about how you have to make other people sacrifice to save the earth <laughs> but the thing is it's not about sacrifice uh, at all it's not about making other people sacrifice or about sacrificing things yourself um, there's an abundance of things that we actually need on this planet um, it's we have to prioritize needs versus wants um, and we can all thrive and a lot have other beings other creatures that live on the earth thrive as well with us if we just um, arrange things the right way so permaculture is really about taking responsibility for your own existence working on your own house and garden first and then um, sharing that with others and kind of leading by example and and just um, having a 
an abundant abundance mentality and um, instead of a scarcity mentality and that's that scarcity mentality is often uh, it drives fear and um, and separation from others whereas an abundance mentality drives community and sharing of resources and um, and that's that's the direction we need to go in and I think you know with the crisis that we're having right now um, I've been really impressed at how for the most part there is that um, that community has really pulled together and is sharing um, is sharing resources and helping each other out and doing groceries for each other and checking in on each other um, sharing plants and uh, teachings and things like that so um, yeah amidst hardship sometimes we see uh, what we're really made of and um, and I think we're we're doing a pretty good job we, and we need to keep this momentum going and keep going in that direction um, and not slip into where some other countries have gone with the, the fear and um, separation that's been happening. So the word permaculture comes um, from Bill Mollison and David Holmgren. Uh, it was coined in the 70s and it kind of it originally was a, a joining of the words permanent and agriculture and now it has come to encompass more permanent human culture. So how can we thrive on this earth, um, you know, for the next thousands of years and um, not, it's different than sustainability has kind of been about doing the least bad um, or trying not to do harm. Whereas um, in permaculture, it's about leaving things better than we found them and you know increasing soil fertility as we also grow in in places and um, how to improve the systems how to design like an ecosystem so um, in a forest uh, in a healthy forest there's many different um, uh, organisms that are working together and nobody Nobody waters it or fertilizes it or weeds it. Um, it's a system that works together. And so when we're thinking with a permaculture mindset, we're approaching um, design problems with that mentality of how do we create these kind of closed loop systems and make sure that, um, that they're able to care for themselves as much as possible and keep breeding more, um, more abundance instead of depleting the systems. So here's another funny little cartoon about going to the pharmacy with an F instead of pharmacy PH and how our food can be, uh, nutraceuticals and, and um, food can be so important for health. And if the soil is not healthy, then the food that's grown in it is not gonna be as nutrient rich as it should be. And and if then if we're eating that food, then we're gonna have issues as well. So we really need to get back to the basics of um, improving our soil and our food and then that will ultimately um, lead us to be healthier as well. So um, Janine Benyus uh, is an author and um, uh, oh, she, um, this is a quote of hers, after 3.8 billion years of research and development, failures are fossils and what surrounds us is the secret to survival. So, you know, it's that looking at nature as it has tried m many different options along the way and it has, through trial and error, has found um, the best systems for going forward and things that have survived and traits that have survived and carried on to now are, are there for a reason um, because they have helped it, those organisms survive in one way or another. So um, Janine Benyus is the head of the biomimicry Institute and they do some really uh, cool work um, looking at natural systems and designing everything from like technology and um, materials to to s social systems and they kind of um, but they always go back to nature and how uh, how evolution has solved different problems that's where they start their questions. So the ethical framework of permaculture. Uh, it focuses on three things, earth care, people care, and fair share. So earth care is uh, recognizing that the earth is a source of all life and that we're not a part, we're, we're part of it, we're not separate from it. So it's not nature 
is over there and people are here we are nature we are part of nature we are all part of this system together and so the i think the problem the way we've gotten to where we are now in society is that we have we've created this separation um, between nature and us and if if we go back to that mentality of that we are one um, it changes our attitude and our approach to things and then people care is uh, supporting each other to change to ways of living that don't harm ourselves or the planet and if um, and develop healthy societies and I talked about that a bit at the beginning just that that developing communities that are supportive and um, uh, feeding each other to you know keep growing and and trying new things and and that we can boost each other up instead of um, being with that scarcity mindset and c competing and having that fear of running out and then fair share is placing limits on consumption and that that's limits on consumption of um, uh, finite resources so there are different kinds of resources uh, we don't have time to get into all of that in in a two-hour workshop but um, you know looking at so finite resources like oil how do we limit the consumption of that and share what we have in an equitable and wise way and use it for the best use um, maybe driving vehicles around with it isn't the best use but you know medical equipment is or you know we need to prioritize what things are being used for and um, and make sure that everybody um, gets what they need to to survive and be healthy so uh, the principles there are t the Holmgren principles are the ones that are most often used David Holmgren's principles um, I kind of separate mine a little differently than than he does. So if you've read or read about permaculture or studied it in any other places, you might have seen these differently. But um, um, they're all the same ideas and principles. I just organize them differently. So um, I like to think of these these first four as kind of principles of human attitude. So it's about how we approach things. Like this little lemur who's like, talk to the hand. <laughs> um, so these are things that we very much have control over how we uh, approach a situation. So the first, the golden rule of permaculture is observe. And um, this is one that we, our lives are so busy and there we're always, we don't take the time to do this as much as we should. There's really a lot um, to be learned in just sitting and observing. And uh, you know, they, this, this, they say in permaculture that you should observe a site for a year before um, doing anything to it and this is very difficult to do and even myself as a permaculture designer and professional um, you know we moved to a property a year and a half ago uh, and I've well I've been in this is the third property I've lived in in London um, in the last eight years and um, you know especially knowing that I'm not always in one place for long it's really hard not to just dive in and start making changes but you need to observe the land and see what's what's working and what's not and uh, how you can tweak things instead of just coming in and bulldozing you know our, our typical approach is just come in raise the ground bulldoze it rip everything out start fresh and that's um, that's definitely not the way we we should be operating so the like the property I've moved on to a year and a half ago has these beautiful full trees mature trees and um, a very full abundant garden but it's very traditional landscaping and so um, having small children has helped me to slow down and, and spend that time observing because I just haven't been able to put in the time I would like to the garden but it's it's you know it's really good to just do that and sit back and and observe what you have and see the best places to make changes and how to turn how to turn problems into solutions so let's move to the next principle turning problems into solutions so um, uh, there are quite a number of what I would call invasive or opportunistic species on the property that I have that were put here intentionally by the previous owner but now I you know my first thought is oh my god there's goat weed everywhere and there's there's English ivy and there's all these other things that I would never have put on the property but um, it forced me to actually eat goat weed for the first time and I knew that it was edible but I had you know there were other choicer 
foods around that I like to forage and um, and I didn't have it at my last property so I had never actually tried it and um, I made soup last year for some guests that were over and everybody including the toddlers loved it and slurped it down and um, and it was great and it was made from the goutweed in my garden that I wouldn't have have you know if I had a different mindset I might have just tried to rip it all out and I do still intend to control it and try and keep it from taking over the whole yard but um, turning turning that problem into a solution is um, is a really important part of permaculture and obtaining a yield so uh, you know thinking about what um, when I'm putting when I'm taking something out of my system and replacing it with something new I want to make sure that I'm getting multiple yields out of that um, new addition and that it's there for a reason it's not just aesthetics or um, uh, you know that it's got it's producing food and or medicine and or shade or habitat or there's there's a huge list of yields that, and aesthetics are a yield as well but the more the more yields you can have from each element in the system the more um, bountiful it will be and the more abundant it will be the last one that's um, that's really controlled by our attitude and approach to things is the, that um, the biggest limit to abundance is creativity so it's it's um, not seeing those links between things and how we can use things to their best um, being you know being close-minded about uh, like there are certain edibles that a lot of people have in their yard and even after I tell people they just really it's kind of like the goat weed thing I had never really been forced pushed to try it before I did have it at my first property and I never took advantage of it then um, but like hostas and they're sold in grocery stores in Asia um, as well as daylilies and so many people here have hostas and daylilies in their yard and they just um, they're not creative about using them or don't know how to or it's different from what they're used to and they think well I don't know that's weird I've never seen it in a grocery store <laughs> but it's in grocery stores in other countries we just need to be more um, open-minded about it um, hey Jessica oh, yep we do have one question uh, Jacob said he'd love to learn more of uh, information about upcoming PDCs in the area okay great I'll, I'll touch on that at the end thanks for that um, there um, yeah when we when we go over the workshops that are coming up through signal boost I'll, I'll throw in some info about the PDC thanks great thanks um, and then after we finish these principles I'll pause for some questions too um, after we get, go through the natural system principles because there's a fair bit of info to take in here um, so these are principles of natural systems these are this is how how ecosystems work how natural systems work and we just through observing them we've learned these things and we can apply these principles to the way we design systems as well so connections um, there's always you know the the web of life the <laughs> you see that that circle and all the drawing all the lines between the animals and the elements in the system and how many connections there are so the more connections you can have between the elements in your system the more resilient the system is the more able it is to withstand shocks and changes um, catch and store energy and materials so uh, there there is this con you know yes nature's abundant and there's always this creation of abundance but there's also entropy and um, there is always a certain loss of energy in the system and the more times we can use uh, our energy or water or something in a site before it leaves our site the the we're slowing down that entropy and we're able to really get so much more out of the system by using something multiple times over so for example um, the rainwater coming down your roof so you know catching it catching it in a rain barrel um, and then having that overflow from the rain barrel going into some sort of swale or natural watering system where it's just automatically going out into your garden beds and watering things and then you've got that storage system as well um, and then uh, maybe you've got a where you've got that overflow you've got um, a little deeper pond area that where you can have um, some different stuff happening there and um, and different things growing and then once that fills up maybe you've got a mushroom bed on the other side of that so using that many times before it's ultimately allowed to leave your site 
whether that's through evaporation or or eventual runoff if you really have a lot. Um, each element performs multiple functions. So, um, so that rain barrel, for example, is an element in the system. That rain barrel could also um, be providing, um, you know, some sort of trellis or growing medium for something. Um, it could be providing shade uh, if it's elevated and you've got some pressure that you want to, if it's elevated so you have a um, pressure, then you can have some shade underneath it for growing things that need shade if you don't have a lot of shade in your yard. Um, uh, what else could we use it for? You could have, there are some that have like a little growing space in the top of them too. And so you can, you know, e anyways, it's about looking at how that element can be used for multiple different things. And then on the flip side of that is each function is supported by multiple elements. So um, uh, that would be like water in the system is obviously critical to any living system. So um, we have that rainwater that's being collected from the roof. We have um, tap water that we can harvest in the city or wells from uh, in rural areas. Maybe there's a pond or a lake or a river that we can um, tie into our system somehow and um, divert a bit of water for our use and then send it back into the, that natural system. Um, so it's, it's looking at how to make sure that you've got um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Where you've got um, the, the same thing being supported, to, it, it makes it a more resilient system where you've got uh, multiple backup systems basically. So if, if it doesn't rain for a while, you've got another source of water. Um, make the least change for the greatest effect. So this is about making sort of the kiss, keep it simple, stupid, keep it, yeah, keep it, keep it simple, stupid, keep it, <laughs> um, get that mentality of just making these little simple changes to things and, um, and that they can, they can actually have a big impact. So, um, not going in and, um, um, plowing up oh, an area and, and tilling it and, and disturbing that so soil, but just going in and um, um, maybe that's not a great example. Let me think again. Okay, so for example, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to that, sorry. So um, you could go in and, and till up an area and then bring in a whole bunch of compost to try and boost the, the fertility of the land and then plant your stuff in there. Um, or you could uh, you could just smother the tops, smother the grass, and um, um, uh, and then just do a light till to get your seeds in, just um, the surface, and then you can add uh, you could add um, microorganisms and, and fungal mycorrhiza uh, organisms to the soil, and then they can improve the soil and do that work for you instead of having to chuck in compost all the time. If you just add the biology to the soil, um, it will it will do the work for you. So um, just doing that a little bit of um, root dipping at the time of planting um, and adding some to your holes when you plant is, is very minimal. It's, it's a very small thing to do, but it will have a huge effect on the on the fertility of the soil um, and be way easier and cost effective and time effective uh, than hauling in compost from somewhere else. Um, use small scale intensive systems. So um, this is kind, kind of similar to the previous one and um, looking at uh, getting a lot of bang for your buck as well. So, um, you know, having a uh, um, What's it called? Uh, sorry, I have a small, I, I have a, a one month old at home and my ba uh, baby brain is <laughs> is making it hard to remember the simple names of things sometimes. Um, you know, when you have a, it's not a greenhouse, it's a cold frame. That's what I'm looking for. So small, small scale intensive system. So a cold frame would be just um, um, putting like a, a, a plastic bottle or cloche or um, some old windows frames around a small area of growing and 
um, there's no there's very there's no technology at all. You're just creating a mini greenhouse um, that's very easy to to move, operate, source, and um, uh, creates a lot of uh, uh, a very different microclimate underneath it. And you can grow fairly intensively in that small space, um, just with very very easy to to source materials. Um, optimize edge. Uh, so in, in natural systems, places that have the most, the edge is the edge between two ecozones um, is the most, is actually the most abundant place. That's where the most biodiversity is. So you can have, you know, the deep, um, the deep rainforest or, or old growth forest, uh, obviously is very important and has very special diversity, biodiversity in there. Um, but the number of species that are supported in that system is actually much less than um, than in the prairie or then at, at that edge between the two. So between the, the prairie and the forest at that edge, that's where you have the most abundant life and, and diversity. And um, like if you take uh, a pond system, you could have a thousand liter pond uh, or whatever, a 10,000 10, liter pond that has is a, you know a nice round circle, and then you can have the same volume of water, another 10,000 liter pond that has um, uh, a crenellated edge where you have it's not just a smooth circle on the edge. You've got kind of ins and outs. Let me let me try out my drawing tool one second. So your pond edge is kind of like this instead of just round, and it's the same volume of water. But you have a lot more edge than you did before and you will have way more life supported in this system than you would in um, in a system that's just a round round edge and then collaborate with succession so natural systems um, have something called succession where they go from um, where they they evolve and the system changes over time and typically in our region here, the end, the, the succession um, moves towards forest. That's what most of this land wants to be as a forest. And when we try and keep it as a lawn where we have this nice pristine green turf grass with no diversity in it, no, no clover, no dandelions, no weeds, uh, no, no creeping Charlie, no whatever whatever stuff is creeping into our into our lawns that we are obsessed about removing for some reason, um, we're really holding back that succession. We're trying to keep it at a very um, primal state with very little diversity. And it's a lot of work to do. Whereas um, if we just let that go, it would eventually other species would move in and then some shrubs would start growing and then some aspen and uh, poplars and those primary succession uh, plants would come and uh, sumac would come in probably um, and they would then prepare the ground for for other trees to come in down the road and eventually it would just become a forest and and it would do that all alone with no help from us at all in fact pretty quickly if we just stepped away from the system and let it go on its own so um, when we're designing systems that and we want to have them be productive but be low maintenance if we're fighting that succession all the time uh, it's going to be a lot more work for us so in permaculture we try and design a system to be sort of in that middle state of succession um, somewhere and because that's also very productive like just like the the edge so you know the old growth forest is not as productive um, so we generally we're, we're aiming to kind of work with a middle succession ground where you have a fair bit of light still coming into the system. It's not all huge mature trees um, because then there's less light and they're less productive. So that middle stage of growth is what um, is what we want for really abundant spaces. And um, and uh, some of it is that this goes back to mentality a little bit, too, but um, you know, letting places, letting go of our desire for things to be manicured and plant, kept in these perfect clumps. You know, natural systems are not like that. You look at a meadow and there's not like a wildflower meadow. There's not a cluster of um, a cluster of asters, New England asters over here and a cluster of milkweed over here. And I mean, there's some of that, but they're also they're very intermixed. And so um, 
part of, we'll get into this in one of the next slides about bias and sentiment and letting go of those and being able to just let plants move around the system and be where they want to be instead of trying to hold them back and keep them where we think they should be, but letting them tell us where they're happiest and where they want to grow. Um, so I'm gonna pause there for a minute and uh, and see if there's any, um, any questions about anything we've talked about so far. Uh, nothing at the moment, but I can, I can give you a moment to type anything they're thinking. But, uh, oh, someone has their hand up. Let's go check that out. Uh, so Charles had his hand up. If you want to just uh, type something in the question box, you can do that. But uh, I don't see anything. Okay. Um. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. A question has just come in. What are some good perennial plants that you recommend we get? Big, broad question. <laughs> some good perennial plants. Uh, yeah, that is a big, broad question. Um, <laughs> So um, at the end of the webinar, we'll get into some techniques uh, and tools that we use in permaculture. And one of them is guilds and one is food forests. And we're not going to get into a lot of detail in them. Um, but um, so my for perennial plants, I have two focuses. My, my one focus is, is food. So can I eat it? <laughs> and if I can't, I'm not that interested in it, unless it's native. And a lot of, I mean, many native plants are also edible or medicinal, medicinal and have uses as well. But um, my, those are my two first priorities when I look at adding something to my, to my uh, designs. Is, is it edible? Um, yes, is it native? And added, uh, there... Yes, food wise. Yeah. Yes, food wise. Okay. Um, so some easy ones and ones that people probably have: hostas, uh, daylilies. The ones that you're more familiar with, rhubarb, uh, asparagus, um, stone crop is another great one that a lot of people have that they don't know is edible. Um, uh, obviously, like fruit trees, fruit and nut trees are usually the base of my designs. I kind of start by looking at how many of those I can squeeze in and then working around them. So fruit and nut trees, um, berry bushes, uh, that's like currants, gooseberries, hascaps, raspberries, um, and uh, and then and then the supporting plants for those. And we'll get into that when we talk about guilds. Um, but yeah, those are those are some some of the main plants I would start with, uh, and herbs, of course. Like there's lots of great herbs. They're good ground cover. They're good supporting plants. They're edible. It's always good to add more of them in your diet. And if you have them growing all over your yard, that's good incentive to to be like oh what can i make tonight with a whole bunch of oregano or thyme or um or what can i do with my lavender um so that yeah those are my go-to's I, I can just add to um you uh, everybody listening you may have seen that reforest london started doing some tree depots again where we give away free trees and we had um, some a big variety of different kinds of apples and peaches and uh, pears and that we quickly ran out, but we're making an, another order and it's actually coming in this week. So very, very soon we'll make an announcement of uh, people being able to go online and order some trees for um, uh, contact free pickup at our office. So that will be coming very soon. <laughs> um, so someone asked, is, isn't sedum edible? I'm not sure if I said that right, it's S-E-D-U-M. Yeah, yeah, sedum, that's uh, stone crop is a sedum. So like autumn joy, okay. Autumn Joy stone crop is, is a very common plant used, but the city uses it in their landscaping a lot, um, and a lot of people have it in their yards. It's all over my yard, <laughs> and I didn't put it there, but um, I, we've been eating lots of it now because it's there. Um, and yeah, there are other varieties of sedums that are edible as well, but that's the one of the most commonly used ones in landscaping is the, um, the stone crop. Nice. Uh, so Nan says, will you be talking about recovering damaged land, i.e. 
uh, brownfields and agri-damaged land. Um, I, she's thinking I mean, about the use of specific taproot plants, et cetera. And would you see would you see the field with these or just let them appear on their own? Great, good questions. Um, we definitely don't have time. That's a that's a big subject matter. We don't have time to get into those um, in this webinar. But um, if like if you have a property like this that you're thinking of, um, would I see the field or let them appear on their own? It depends on your time frame, how quickly you want to see things get done. Um, the plants will just appear on their own, like they know, uh, seems strange, but they kind of know where they need to be and they come in and we'll talk, we'll, we'll see that slide coming up too a bit um, about observations. Um, so yeah, some of, the, some of the plants will, they'll come in and, and start doing the work for you if you want to speed it up then uh, certainly seed, seed a field and add, add things you want. Um, if it's, if it's um, contaminated land though, you need to, you need to be removing that um, organic matter. So if you're seeding the field with things, then you need to cut it and remove it and not compost it or return it back to the soil. If, you're, if there are certain chemicals that you're trying to remove, you need to get them off the site in, in the plants once the plant uptakes them. So, okay, next. Okay, Jacob says, curious about hostas and daylilies as edibles. So I believe you started to mention that. So I guess you wanted a bit more information. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, I could go, we could have a whole webinar just on, on how to use all these things. Um, and we don't have a lot of time, but basically hostas are edible when they're young, um, before they unfurl. And you can, you can steam them or they're, they're very easy to prepare. Um, you can prepare them like asparagus or use them as any other pot greens. Daylilies are, uh, the roots are edible, the shoots, the buds and the flowers all at different times of year. So um, the internet has lots of uh, information about how to use them and what parts you would use at different times of year. It's so cool to hear about different, like really common plants that you can actually eat and you walk by them all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, here's a bit of a longer one, let's see. So Charles, he lives in a new area and they have a walkout that unfortunately is higher to the neighbors behind us. We have rain barrels. However, the overflow is saturating the remainder of the property. We have a raised bed garden, south facing. However, the back of the property line is saturated. Any suggestions? Mm, <laughs> that's a, that's a, a big question um, to get into and pretty specific. Um, so I, d I don't know if, I, yeah. Um. I know at the end we share um, contact information. So that might be yeah. one where uh, she can reach out after if need be. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, it's pretty specific to that property. Uh, and someone, Laura was asking, can you repeat the name of that um, type of plant? I think she's she said septum. So I think she's, referring to the sedums, that's S-E-D-U-M. Oh, sedum, yeah, or stone crop. Autumn, Autumn Joy stone crop is the most commonly seen one. Okay, one more question, but it says this is a question for the end. So yeah, we can wait for that one. <laughs> and that okay. should be everything. Great, okay, so let's continue. Um, on and then we'll have we'll have time for other uh oh, how do i get back here there we go um yeah there'll be other breaks for questions too um so at the soil food web as i mentioned soil uh is is critical to the the system it's the base of the system and um i, I first i learned about permaculture when i was living and working in alberta and um I said this at a keynote address to, to the Alberta Agriculture Symposium was that soil is more important than oil. And uh, they were agriculturalists, so they all agreed with me. But <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a controversial thing to say in Alberta of all places, um, but it's, it's totally true. And um, this is really, uh, it is a finite resource and we don't think of it as such, but it is and we're losing um, tons of topsoil every year and we really need to change our growing practices to stop that and also to start using the soil as a carbon sink because it can be um, a huge tool in combating climate change 
and um, like we could sink tons of carbon into the soil if we just increase the organic matter in it and let it um, let it hold it down there and cycle it through plants. Um, so one teaspoon of soil, one teaspoon of healthy soil has a billion bacteria, which includes 20 to 30,000 different species, which is crazy to even, we don't even know what they all are. <laughs> um, several yards of fungal hypha. Fungal hypha is like the little threads that the fungus puts out. If you ever break into a compost pile or lift up a log and you see those white threads kind of running through stuff, that's the fungal hypha. Several thousand protozoa and a few dozen nematodes. And um, every time we till the soil or break it up, we're killing those organisms. And then there's this huge release of nutrients. Um, and so we see this spike in growth, but then we've lost that life that, that's gonna keep cycling that, those nutrients um, because it gets, uh, it, it gets released when they die. And then there's, there's no uh, other, there's, the, the cycle, um, the soil food web is broken and the, organ, the next organisms can't uptake that nutrients. Like typically what happens is an organism dies and then the next organism eats it and then something eats that and then that dies and then they, it, it goes in the cycle. When you break, um, break up the soil, you're breaking up that cycle and you're releasing the nutrients quickly, but, um, but then they're lost from the system. So then you need to start adding um, compost and fertilizers and stuff. Um, so one of the first things to do is learn about no-till gardening and organic practices to maintain a healthy soil food web. Um, and I, I never plant anything without adding um, a little boost of uh, mycorrhiza and, um, and uh, healthy organisms. And there's, there's, uh, there are products that you can use to help you do this. Um, uh, what's the name of the... Well, Mike... M-Y-K-E, um, Mike is one product. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna, Mike Grow is a mycorrhizal inoculant. Um, there's another one uh, that I, just a second, I'm just I'm having a mummy brain again, I can't remember the name of it. Um, uh but it, yeah soil it's a soil activator um and i can't remember what it's called right now but they um i don't know if they make it anymore it seems like it's not on their website anymore so it doesn't matter that i can't remember the name of it <laughs> um when, an easy thing to do is just go out to a healthy forest near you and grab like a cup of soil and then you can either put that in a bucket of water and um and kind of grow it out a bit and then um, use that in your, add a little bit of that to each hole um, or even just, you know, just take the soil instead of adding it to a bucket of water, just take take a cup or two of healthy forest soil and, um, and then add a few teaspoons, tablespoons to your planting hole when you plant and you'll be inoculating your soil with good stuff. Um, sorry, Root Rescue. Root Rescue and Soil Activator. They're, the company is called Earth Alive. And they, um, I'm not sure if they make the root rescue anymore because, like I said, it's not on their website. But Earth Alive is the company, um, and I really like their products. And so those are two that uh, I would recommend using every time you plant. And and you'll just give that little boost to your soil and add those good organisms to it and make your life much easier because your plants will be healthier and, um, and happier and more disease resistant and less work for you to care for and more abundant. So let's get back to our slides. So patterns and observation. Usually we would take the time, if this was an in-person workshop, we would take the time to, to go do a little observation exercise outside, but this is something you could do after the webinar. If you have five or 10 minutes, just go walk around outside and observe things and look for patterns and um there whoops um yeah there are there are patterns everywhere around us um spirals nets branching patterns uh, circles waves lobes fractals there's all there's patterns everywhere 
and um, once you start seeing them then you can start thinking about why and how and what is it teaching us and um, uh, so this slide shows um, uh, a, a very distinct pattern here um, and normally I would ask people uh, what they think it is, why why all the dandelions seem to be in this area, but it's a little harder to make things interactive, so uh, I'll talk you through it. But you can see it's there's dandelions everywhere, but there's definitely a concentration of them here. And this is where there's an old driveway. So the soil is very compacted and nutrient uh, poor, and the dandelions are a taprooted plant. And they there was the somebody asked a question about um, uh, whether to let plants come in naturally or seed an area if you're trying to remediate it. Um, here's a good example of the plants coming in and doing their job. They know what, what needs to be done to heal the soil here. And so um, the, dan there's dandelions here. I would bet there's also probably a lot of burdock and some other taprooted plants that have come in here. And they are trying to heal this soil by breaking up the, breaking up the compaction and adding organic matter. Um, and adding certain nutrients. So dandelions will also, can also be a sign of low calcium. If there's low calcium in an area, then um, they're one of the plants that will do all right and be able to help um, bring that calcium back into the system. So there's tons that we can observe from plants and just even like what weeds are growing in a certain area can be an indication of, of what's wrong with that soil and how, and so if you correct that problem and often those weeds will actually just disappear on their own because their job is done there. They're not, they'll move on to be to work elsewhere. Um, sentiment and bias. So um, this is, I, I touched on this a little bit in the principles where I talked about how, you know, letting the plants move around on their own and not being so tied to having things in rows or in clumps of one species and another species, but letting, um, so this is, so we all have sentiments and biases and, um, this has come up a lot too with the race discussions re recently too um that you know even even those of us who feel like we are you know neutral and and don't have um uh any racist tendencies that there's we still have biases and um so being aware of them is the first step and then um and then you can either accept them and just say well i have a sentiment towards flushing toilets and i'm not going to use a composting toilet because i think it's disgusting and i like flushing I don't care if I'm flushing perfectly good tap water, uh, potable water down the down the drain. We have the luxury of doing that here. We're not in a developing country, blah, blah, blah. You can hold that sentiment and just be like, I'm not going to let go of it. <laughs> um, or you can say, well, geez, why why am I so fixed on using potable water to flush my toilet? Maybe, maybe I really like flushing toilets. Uh, maybe it doesn't have to be potable water and I could um, and set, I, you know, I'm not ready to use a composting toilet, but maybe I could somehow set up a system to use my rainwater. And of course, this is legal in some places and not in others. So that's it's a deeper discussion to get into. But um, uh, and then biases against dandelions, for example, um, or uh, biases against having uh, a, quote, messy yard and or your neighbors have biases and you want to maintain good relationships with your neighbors. So maybe, you know, I'm, I w did a site visit for um, their now new new clients, uh, went to their property last week and, or earlier this week and their front yard is very manicured, perfectly trimmed hedges and everything is very tidy and neat. And then and that's their what they show to their neighbors and they want to fit in the neighborhood and have that look and and feel to their house. And then in the backyard, it's a totally different story. There's sort of the English garden stuff happening in the one spot and then all these native plants at the back and very more wild look. Um, and so, you know, we have to work with the biases around us as well, not just our own, but at least be aware of them. Okay, poll time. Um, there's uh, two more polls to do, if we can get those up, Kelsey. And that'll sure. help direct my, the next bit of the presentation a little bit. Okay, so here's a, are you urban or rural? So we'll get a better idea of um, our audience and what you guys are dealing with for your property. Okay. Lots of responses coming in so far. It looks like it's about three quarters urban and uh, about one quarter rural. 
You guys are fast. Oh, nice. Looks like only one person left to vote. So it looks like, oh, there we go. 80% urban, 20% rural. Okay. okay. Good to know. So the next one is how much land do you have? So if you know it, um, because you're urban, it may be mostly pretty small, but so it'll give you some time to do that. So far, people are mostly saying less than 0.25 acres. So mostly some pretty small spots. Um, yeah, 11% so far have said more than one acre. So a few people do have a bigger lot. Might be there, those uh, rural folks. They're almost all in. Hey, you guys are good. Okay, so the final results are 52% said less than 0.25 acres, 36% said 0.25 to half an acre, 4% um, said 0.5 to one, and then 8% said more than one acre. Great, thanks everybody. Okay, so some of the rural people have pretty small properties, but um, that, that's good to know. So that'll help a bit in, in where I focus our discussion a bit coming up. Um, so oh, I can add to somebody put in that question box that they have a hundred acres. So we've got one person oh, nice. dealing with lots of land. <laughs> That's great. Lots of opportunity. <laughs> and if you need some help with design, give me a call. <laughs> um, okay, so zones. Um, this is a, a tool that we use in permaculture um, to kind of, um, we separate the property into different zones depending on how um, how frequently, how often the, the place is used, sort of what's what's grown there, but also how much care it needs. So how much how much um, time we're going to spend there, either voluntarily because we like to spend time there, or um, because that there are needs in that system that need us there. Like it, like if we have chickens, they need daily um, daily care and egg collection, and so we're going to want them closer to our house instead of you know, way in the back 40 where you have to um, trek out there every day to see them. Um, so in an urban area with a small yard, you might not have room for all of these zones, um, but I'll just go through them here and then um, uh, you'll probably just be focusing on zone one, two, maybe zone three in an urban yard. Um, but if you can, it's always nice to have a bit of zone five. Um, so zone one requires frequent visits for observation or work like a hen house, seedlings, um, kitchen herbs, things that you're going to be using daily or need daily care. Zone two is less intensively managed, like um, you might still have vegetable crops there, but they're your main crop. They don't need, they're not tomatoes that need watering and babying every day. They might be um, squash or grains or things that you can kind of plant and, and more or less leave um, to tend to themselves. Uh, a, a more intensively managed orchard. Zone three would be a farm zone if you have commercial crops and animals, um, large-scale water storage like uh, like ponds or dams. Um, if you have 100 acres you can do that, not if you're on a quarter of an acre or less. Um, trees that are pruned less, um, that might get pruned uh, once every five years instead of every, or, or once a year instead of a few times a year like you would if you had um, very intensively managed fruit trees. Zone four is almost forest or wilderness but is managed a bit for wild gathering of food and fuel and things like that. And then zone five is natural and unmanaged. So that's where we go to rest and repose and sit and observe and learn the rules of the, of the natural ecosystems around us and then we can learn those, we can apply those rules to, um, to our design work. So this is an example of um, of a rural property I'm working with and this is just some some basic zone layout that we've done so the purple is zone one this is living in social space daily needs daily food production um, intensive production uh, and they this property there they also produce um, uh, soaps handmade handmade soaps and body care products and stuff so um, intensive production of the herbs and plants needed for that and um, so the house is under this block here. Can you, um, Kelsey, can you see my cursor when I'm moving my, the hand around? Yes, I can. Okay. Or we can. Okay. 
Um, so the, so these are this is where that zone one stuff would be taking place. Zone two is the yellow, and so things they don't they don't have to be um, uh, contiguous spaces, as you can see, they can be broken up by by some areas. But um, uh, so this would be herbs and products for the store, home food production, um, the 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 shop with tools and storage, uh, rainwater collection, small livestock like poultry, um, and then uh, zone two three would be the this food forest here, fruit and nut trees that are pruned um, annually, perennial foods, poultry forage, cover crops, passive watering systems, um, and then there could be some food forestry stuff happening here as well. Pasture zone, zone three would be the pasture. Um, and yeah, because we're mostly urban, I'm not going to get into this, all of these, you can read them on your own. Um, and then zone four, five is the wild and unmanaged spaces. Um, and if you're doing uh, great for meditation or for foraging and hunting, um, uh, if you're into those things. Oh, um, Jess, uh, Kate yes. asks, how big is that property? Uh, mm, I haven't worked on it in a few months. I'm trying to think. Um, I think it's around 10 acres. Um, okay, needs and yields. So this is uh, this is a tool. The need, a needs and yields analysis is a tool that we use in permaculture and can really help you figure out um, by looking at the elements on your property um, and placing them in relation to each other so that they are in, they can interact better. So that there's more of those connections um, and so that maybe the what one element is producing is maybe the need of another element. So the yield of one element in the system might be the need of another element in the system. And so if you can place them in close proximity to each other, then they it just makes everything that much easier to, to manage and care for, or things maybe, maybe there's even no human intervention needed for the, uh, the products of one system to become the inputs of the next. Um, uh, a needs and yields analysis can also point out what needs are not being satisfied by the design as you have it now, and then so how can you how can you include something that will produce that will support that need, um, or maybe there's a yield that you hadn't thought to use that you through doing the needs and yields analysis you think oh yeah that I could how do I take advantage of that? Um, so uh, often this exercise is done with a chicken or or a duck or something, but because most of us are urban um, on this webinar, I decided to use a raised garden bed as an example. So, um, uh, I think I think I'll just work. I was going to try and do this interactive, but I think it's I think it'll be tricky with <laughs> with different questions coming into and maybe getting lost. Um, so. So the needs of, of a raised bed system would be um, uh, that it needs, uh, well, if it's a raised bed that needs some kind of edging, you need organic matter to add to it, uh, mulch, um, disturbance and cultivation of, of um, to get it established at first, seeds and seedlings would be a need, water, sunlight, pollinators. Uh, healthy soil biota, so whether you're bringing those in as a separate need and adding them as a, as a separate element or whether they're coming in with the organic matter that you're bringing, um, and freedom from pests and diseases. And so that would be human care for it would um, or, or different systems to protect, like <laughs> um, we've got very voracious rabbits around our house that have um, made me be a little more diligent than usual about how I protect things because my dogs are not able to just at our old house we had a smaller property and they were pretty good at just keeping the rodents under control but they can't and our dogs are older now they can't keep on top of the their job as well as they used to so um, we've lost some plants to rabbits and chipmunks and um, so freedoms from pests and disease is very important if you want to have a yield 
so then the, the yields from this system um, would be uh, vegetables, herbs, fruits, grain, flowers, uh, seeds, if you're going to be saving seeds for, for future harvest or for selling or for, um, for sharing with friends and family. Uh, also, a yield can be biodiversity and predator habitat um, so that you have uh, beneficial predators in your, in your system. Like, consciously planting things that will uh, will provide habitat for, for predatory wasps um, to control some of the pests and diseases that you want you don't want to have in your system. Um, a yield can be organic matter so um, using the using the, the leftovers from that you know when you're cutting stuff back or adding it into the soil or composting it somewhere nearby and then returning it to the soil. Um, a veggie bed can also be an amenity. It can be aesthetic. It can be um, it can be used to divide up a space or to uh, to mark out um, to mark out different sections of a property. Um, it can be beautiful. Um, it could add employment if you want to be or um, income if you want to be selling some of the product product production of it. Uh, so. So that's an example of how you could do a needs and yields analysis, and that's one element in the system you're looking at. Um, a fruit tree would, could be another element, or um, uh, a, uh, a rain barrel. Um, and, and then you can look at what the needs and yields of each of those are, and then you can kind of, um, if you put them out on cue cards, and you can kind of place them, lay them around, um, and see how, how they're best situated in relation to each other to have the outputs of one system become the inputs for the next system. So does that all make sense? If we have any questions about that, let's uh... Someone just commented, a uh, rabbit pie, problem to food. <laughs> Yes, the problem is the solution. Mm -hmm. I have I have thought about that and joked about that. My my seven year old and three year old um, are not so keen on it. <laughs> uh, I've never actually tried rabbit, but I'm I know it was my my opa's favorite meat. He um, he really liked rabbit meat. So maybe one day I'll get there, but I have to get the kids on board first or trick them. I also want to add, we're a reasonably somewhat small group, so I'm thinking if anybody wants to say something but would rather say it out loud, if you find that easier, if you click the button that makes your hand raised, um, I think we're fine to do that. It helps to make it a little bit, bit more back and forth sure. and engaged, so I'd be fine with that. Okay, yeah, me too. Um, and. Oh, yeah, so Nan, she's the one that said rabbit pie. She says, no pressure treated wood for raised gardens? Uh, yes, that's a good point. Um, I would definitely not use, well, for if you're going to be harvesting food from them, no, do not use pressure treated wood. You would use cedar or some other hardwood um, if you can't afford cedar. Okay, that's it for now. Actually, we had a question earlier that, that I should go back to. Do, do, do. Uh, what's the best way to know or figure out what's missing in our soil? Um, and so what toxins are in it um, and what levels would be too high? And this is from Laura. She also said that she has an orchard. She's the one with the large property. Okay, great. Um, um, well, for, especially for, for toxins and stuff, um, the best thing to do is send in soil samples to A&L laboratories in London. Um, I'm going to write that A and L laboratories. So they have a bunch of different uh, soil tests that you can have done. Some of them are just looking at the nutrient levels, and some of them will look at all those, um, you know, lead levels and any contaminants, petrochlor, petrochemicals, and things. Um, so that's a good place to start. And then um, there's also, if you want to, it, it's it's great to know. Obviously, great to know what toxins are in your soil. Um, also good to know where you stand in terms of your nutrient levels, um, but sometimes those don't always tell you, like there can be very high calcium levels, but they might not be being taken up by the plants um, and uh, if you don't have the right soil biology. So this is a colleague of mine, Doc Ter. She's, uh, she's in Quebec, but you can send her 
um, soil samples and she will look specifically at the soil biology. So she will analyze, um, you know, how many, what, the nematodes that are there and whether they're beneficial or predatory and uh, how many, um, what your fungal health is like if you have mycorrhizal, um, mycorrhiza in the soil or not um, and, uh, and bacteria with the beneficial or, um, or problematic bacteria and if there's enough. And so she's working on this project in Downsview with me and we're using cover crops and, um, and compost tea sprays and stuff to remediate the soil biology over the next few years to prep it for intensive agriculture. Um, and she, so yeah, this is, they're kind of different. This is the traditional approach is just to look at your you know, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, um, but that really doesn't tell you enough. And, uh, um, and what you should be focusing on is the soil biology. If you get the soil biology right, they can make, they can make use of the minerals that are there much more effectively. So Nan has asked if these resources are on the resource handout or if they possibly could be added. Um, they could be added. I don't think they're there yet. No, some of them I'm, I'm just thinking of as I go through the workshop. Oh yeah, I should have included this. So yeah, so, I can. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I can. I I can add those and send out an, another one. You can email it out, right, Kelsey? Yeah, in the follow-up email, we'll send the recording and a few like links to other things, so um, we can make a point to add in there. Um. Just in case anyone hasn't noticed too, there's three handout documents in the menu where it says handouts, so you can download those, just in case anyone hasn't seen it. Okay. Um, that. Okay, that's it for now. Okay. So, um, so urban permaculture, 80% of you guys on the call are urban, so, um, and this is where I, I really started the focus of my work. And um, I used to be an urban planner, actually, and uh, got into that because um, I think cities are a huge opportunity to be more sustainable uh, it, it's, as a society. There's, there's so many opportunities in cities to make use of, of space and, um, you know, build off of systems. And um, we don't do a very good job of that in our country. We're, we're very spread out and we don't, we send a lot of stuff to waste instead of closing that loop of waste equals food. And the, the yield of one product is the need of the next. So um, in urban permaculture, there's, there's really good opportunities for small space design. Um, there's a large waste stream as a resource. Like I don't know how many countless bags of leaves I've picked up from my neighbors and <laughs> stolen them. Um, scurried them away back to my house and added them to my um, to my beds and compost piles and used them as mulch and um, I've picked up bales of straw outside of a theater that were used as a stage prop and um, I really miss having a truck for that kind of stuff. <laughs> it was like oh look uh, a bathtub I'm going to use that as a raise as a pond system in my garden um, or uh, or bales of straw or uh, pallets. And so anyways, there's huge waste streams in the city that are, we're all in close proximity. If you don't have a vehicle, sometimes you can just um, wheelbarrow things down. You know, if it's your neighbors putting stuff out, just bring your wheelbarrow, drag it back to your house. Um, I have a, uh, a great picture of my friend Margo who stuffed her, she doesn't have a truck, but she still goes and picks up um, garden bag, leaf bags from her neighbors. And I think she had like, in her car, she probably had like five bags of leaves crammed in the back seat one, one year. <laughs> I drove past her on the street. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, there's a lot of water harvesting opportunities. There's lots of hard surfaces. We have roofs and sidewalks and roads and um, patios and decks and uh, decks are harder to harvest from. But anyways, there's an, an abundance of uh, uh, impermeable surfaces that we can, instead of seeing that they, they're a problem in many ways, but we can see them as an opportunity. The problem is the solution and use them um, for water harvesting. So as long as we have uh, our drainage um, in mind when, uh, if, if we can take advantage of the, the way that they're naturally draining or 
um, or set them up to drain to a specific area so that we can harvest them, then, um, then that's great. This is actually a picture of the first house I lived in here. There was um, the house, the house was over here and there was a, uh, a paved area between the house and the garden. And so we built this little aqueduct to take the downspout uh, across that paved area and then had it come down this rain chain, which aerates it, adds life to it and oxygen and beautifies it. It's beautiful in the rain, it sounds great. Um, it freezes in cool patterns too. Um, and then it would travel through this um, little dry bed. And actually these rocks came from, my roommate at the time worked at, in the, she was a geologist. And so they were getting rid of all these rock samples in the basement of the geology building. And they're beautiful rock samples and they have, you know, they have some writing on some of them, but they're core samples and all sorts of cool things. And so she brought them home and we repurposed them so that we were using that waste stream as a resource um, and had all these cool rocks from, you know, the Canadian shield and stuff in our yard. Um, and then that, that this water flowed into this channel, which was a pathway, but also doubled as, um, as water, water, um, harvesting and took that water out into the out into the yard and automatically watered these beds on the side of the path. So um, there's also a multitude of microclimates. So you have you have um, mature trees with shade and you have sunny areas and you have buildings that are, you know, the south side or the west side of a building that are going to be very hot and um, like a brick brick building or stone will hold that heat and create a microclimate or you can have um, the, on the north side that will be shadier and um, uh, protected areas that are protected from the wind. So you have uh, a lot of microclimates to work with. There's a lot of human resources too. So um, friends and uh, neighbors, volunteers, people who want to learn permaculture. We used to do uh, one or two a year um, perma blitzes where I, if I, I had a client who I, we would do the design and then um, instead of having me do the, the installation work or them doing it themselves, we would host a perma blitz and, um, and volunteers would come and spend the day and get uh, free lunch and beverages, um, learn permaculture, help get the, the, everything set up and installed for the design. Um, and, uh, and then they would have this great functioning uh, permaculture system. Um, and there's community. There's actually, there's, um, I should add these to the resource page too. There's some good Facebook. I know not everybody's on Facebook, but there's some good Facebook pages um, for the local community of those that are in London. Um, there's, uh, there's Urban, Urban Permaculture London is um, run by my friend Becky Ellis. Um, there's Forage City London. Uh, I'm writing them down as I'm saying them in, on my own notes. Um, Forage City London, there's uh, uh, Few All is the um, Friends of Urban Agriculture London. So, um, you know, you have you have people in community, like-minded community, it's easier to find people that think like you in an urban area sometimes than in a rural area, especially if you're on the outside, of, uh, on the, not in the mainstream of society. So, um, so those are all great resources in the city. Um, did I? Right. So, uh, so I think we'll do another. I'll, I'll try and keep this next bit to a half hour, and then we'll leave fifteen minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to go through a few practical techniques because this is just a, an intro workshop, so I'm not going to have time to get into a lot of detail. But these are some things that you can take away from this and go home and and start applying. Um, but I want to preface it by saying that um, permaculture is a, isn't these things. It's not, it's not um, herb spirals. It's not food forests. Permaculture is a way of thinking and approaching design. It can be used for designing monetary systems. It can be used for social systems. It can be used for gardens and plants, but that's not all it is. It's about how we think about problems and design solutions for them. And so um, these are some techniques that we can use, but they're not, they need to be applied uh, to the right problem. So sheet mulch um, is great for a small area. Um, it's not great if you're trying to take over an acre or two acres of land and convert it into something else. It's just way too um, intensive uh, um, in terms of 
um, uh, labor and materials to, to sheet mulch a large area. It's just, it's not going to be effective. So, um, you know, and another example, swales, swales are a, uh, a water harvesting tool that if, if some of you have um, done any research on permaculture, you might have come across some swale stuff about swales. Um, I do use them in urban areas uh, and I've um, used them in, in rural areas for sure as well, but um, I had clients in Manitoba who had taken um, uh, a workshop um, and it, uh, a permaculture workshop with Jeff Lawton and uh, learned all about swales and he's a he's a permaculturist from Australia, um, a big name in permaculture. Um, but swales are very important where he works in in arid regions um, in the Middle East and in Australia. Um, and they thought they needed swales in their property that we bought that they bought in Manitoba that was fully wooded and um, bush lot and had a very high water table. So it, they're not blanket solutions. They're not blanket tools to just apply wherever you need to look at what what you're trying to solve what problem you're trying to solve and, and the best way to meet it so swales are great for certain applications but not everywhere same with sheet mulching same with herbs files so all of these things take them with a grain of salt understand the principles of them and 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 think about whether they're actually what you need in your system uh, so um, sheet mulch and you do have a handout that's like a one pager on how to do like the bomb proof sheet mulch. I don't, I often don't follow all the steps on that um, sheet mulch or all the layers, I should say. The steps are important, but having all those layers are not as critical. Um, but the idea is that, so turf grass, um, turf grass is very uh, non-biodiverse and non-productive. There's not much yield from it. Um, a good way to take over the area without killing that soil biology is to sheet mulch it. So typically we would go in, um, most people would go in and just and uh, get sod cutters, cut out the sod and then till the soil. You've just, just, you've just removed organic matter and then destroyed all the life in the soil that is going to help keep it healthy and fertile. So with sheet mulching instead we smother that organic matter, that the green turf grass that's there, we smother it and kill it and turn it into organic matter that's going to go back into the soil and feed those organisms that are still there and healthy and thriving because we haven't tilled the soil. So um, you're covering the soil with cardboard, newspaper, um, things to, to kill off that grass um, and then, then you can put uh, compost on top, uh, topsoil, um, whatever you if if you're going to be planting in it um, right away or within the in the next couple months, then you would want to add some compost or topsoil and then mulch on top of that. If you are preparing an area that you can, if you if you're planting ahead enough that you can prepare an area and let it sit for a year or so before you're going to be using it, um, then you could just put mulch on top of your cardboard newspaper and that that's enough. Um, but if you're going to be planting in it in a, you know that season then you definitely want to add some compost or, or topsoil to have um, have that there for the plants to use right away um, but anyway so this is a great technique for, for small spaces to take over uh, an area of grass and uh, and maintain that soil biology and life that's there uh, a herb spiral um, is a nice aesthetic touch to urban yards, um, not as applicable when you have more space, but it's a, um, a very good use of vertical and horizontal space. So you're, you're, you're um, growing all your herbs in basically a five by five foot area instead of having them spread out in rows. They're all there. You have them, you know, you would hope, ideally put this somewhere close to your kitchen or where you're going to be using the herbs um, so that you can just pop out. And, and harvest some while you're preparing food. Um, and uh, so you're taking that big long row that you would have spread out and you're curling it up. Um, you're, you're rolling it up and having it go vertically as well. So you grow, have a lot of growing area in a very small space. And you're also creating different microclimates. So you have at the top, it's really dry and, um, and sunny. On the back side, you're gonna have a little more shade and protection. Um, and then depending on where the wind is in relation to your herb spiral, you'll have protection from that on certain side and then drainage 
to some people um, you, you can add like a little catchment area at the at the bottom of it for water and then you can have some more water loving herbs there but I've, I've never gone that far um, it's easy to water it's easy to harvest from it's aesthetically pleasing um, I've made them out of wood like the so the sorry the supporting sides I've used field stone I've used wood I've used bricks I've used um, pavers uh, depending you know if you have whatever you have on hand is great using resources that you have on hand um, or you can you can go and purchase um, bricks salvaged bricks or something to use um, anyway so that's a neat um, uh, a neat little trick to use um, companion planting so this is um, the idea of planting things in relation to each other so that those so that they can help support each other so um, the well quoted um, or well shared companion planting that indigenous people did on this land uh, in especially in southwestern Ontario where we lived was the uh, corn the three sisters corn beans and squash and they all provide um, uh, benefits to each other so the beans fertilize the corn and they and the corn provides support for the beans to grow up and then the squash provides shade on the ground between the plants um, and then also um, uh, not not ironically but I'm sure with very um, solid intent these three um, foods together make a complete protein and are very healthy so three sisters soup um, is is a is all you need <laughs> it's got all the all the nutrients you need in it so um, uh, companion planting can be you can be looking at how plants use physical space with each other so um, that can be above and below ground so how they use the above ground space and share it uh, but also their root systems so some plants are more shallow rooted and some are, are more deep rooted um, and so they can be planted in closer proximity together and you can and then you can you can plant more densely in a given area trap plants so planting specific things that will um, attract the uh, pull pests away from the plants that you want to protect you can plant um, aromatic herbs and things like that will repel uh, insects or disguise plants so um, alliums like garlic and chives are good to have around because they might you know the bug uh, a predator pest might be flying along like looking for your apple tree and then all of a sudden all they, they can't smell the apple anymore they can just smell chives or garlic and they get kind of lost and confused and they can't find your plant anymore um, chemical and biological boosters so there are plants that help um, can help uh, help each other grow for different reasons so like beans don't grow well next with with onions and garlic tomatoes do better when they're planted with parsley and chives um, and uh, you can use um, marigolds as well or nasturtiums um, to help tomatoes be healthy uh, alley cropping is where you're planting nitrogen fixers in between um, this is kind of getting into like using shrubs and trees a bit with uh, with veggie crops but you could also use um, uh, you could do it on a smaller scale and have have rows of clover and things in between your vegetables so um, guilds this is taking companion planting to the to the next level where we're we're really putting all of these things in place in what in a small area so um, usually there's a central element in a guild like an apple tree or a, um, like a fruit or nut tree and then you have different um, uh, different plants that are used for for to help keep that tree healthy and um, boost its immune system uh, and help it be more productive as well so grass suppressing bulbs can be planted around the edges to keep the grass out grass um, uh, a really interesting um, fact is that grass likes more bacterial dominant soil and trees and shrubs like more fungal dominant soil so um, keeping the grass out isn't just 
um, you know, for for aesthetics or for for the root zone or for for so that you can have these other plants around the base of the tree. It's actually much easy that the grass is trying to keep the soil bacterial dominant and the tree is trying to make it fungal dominant so they're competing with each other so having grass around the base of your tree is, um, is stressful for the tree they're trying to do different things to the soil so if you can keep the grass away from your root zone um, the tree will be much happier and healthier uh, so then you can have like insect and bird attractors um, plants that will attract beneficial insects and birds to um, to control pests you can have um, specific plants that, that you can chop down for mulch, like comfrey or rhubarb, where they're very productive and um, they can be cut back a couple times a year. And then instead of hauling that off um, to a compost pile and then bringing it back after it's decomposed, you can just chop and drop and lay all that stuff down right under the base of your your fruit tree. And, um, and it, then it just decomposes on site and saves you work. And you're, you're using that yield um, right on site and placing those elements like in the needs and yields analysis right where we've got the output of one system is the input for the next and the closer they are to each other the less work there is for you uh, then also nutrient accumulators so there's um, uh, dynamic accumulators are plants that are good at drawing up specific nutrients from the soil so if, if you know that your soil is lacking in certain nutrients you can focus on bringing in nutrient accumulators that are um, uh, are specific to those nutrients. Um, in the resource page, there's a book called Gaia's Garden, and it has charts of some of those nutrient accumulators. That's the most accessible book. There's also charts. There's a, a textbook called Edible Forest Gardens. It's actually a huge, two huge volume textbook, um, and it's got lots of tables of that as well, but it's also, it costs as much as textbooks. It's like hundreds of dollars. So um, Guy's Garden, I know, is at the London Public Library and probably lots of other libraries and um, is also much cheaper and more accessible to read as well. It's not as heavy content, but it has those tables. Um, nitrogen fixers, if you, instead of having to bring fertilizer and compost in, if you have those nitrogen fixers planted right around th the base of the tree, then you're saving yourself that work. And so those can be um, uh, herbaceous plants like um, like clover or alfalfa, or they can be shrubs like New Jersey tea um, is a nice native nitrogen fixer, um, or carragana or um, sea buckthorn. So depending on the space you have, um, whether you have more or less space, you can you can size your plants accordingly. Uh, and then habitat nooks. So um, if you can, it's it's great to include, like, and if your bias isn't against, or your sentiment isn't against the <laughs> um, the aesthetics of it, having like a pile of rocks or some, some logs lying around in your brush piles lying around um, are great habitat for um, snakes and frogs and ladybugs. And um, if you, uh, I've actually taken logs and drilled holes in them before for predatory wasps and then have those near near fruit trees and stuff so that you know that those um, uh, predatory wasps are going to have habitat and can help keep in check your your predators or your pests sorry um, so yeah creating habitat nooks for beneficials is great as well uh, and then food forests take this to the next level so there here you have multiple guilds um, that are all kind of working together um, and creating a food forest so this um i mean in a very small property you could you could call it a food forest if you want if you have two or three fruit trees maybe but really it's not it's more it's more like three set you know different guilds but um i don't know at what size quite um threshold it becomes a food forest but it, it's larger scale and um so you're using the vertical and horizontal space um, very well as well as um, uh, having things come into production at different times so temporal space is also something to consider so when i'm designing a food forest i'm also thinking of having yield from you know late may early june to the end of october november so making sure that you have something that's productive at all times of year so making use of temporal space um, 
there are seven layers in a food forest. These mimic natural forests. So in a, in a healthy forest, we have an overstory, an understory, a shrub layer, a herb, herbaceous layer, a root zone, um, vines, and then also the mycel mycelium um, layer. And so if we're trying to work with succession and reduce our, um, our imp the input that we need to keep a system healthy, we want to recreate those seven layers and um, and create that kind of that stage of succession where we have all these layers of a forest, um, but that they're also all producing something for us. Um, and we'll get in the in the full day workshop. We'll get into these seven layers in in more detail and what kinds of things you could include in all of them. Um, and so you can have you can have this like in the picture in the picture on the slide where you've got kind of guild, these guilds that are all going to join together eventually and become a food forest. Um, uh, and each one has all of the elements of the system, or you could have, you know, certain areas that are where you have your pollinator attractors. You don't have to have the pollinator attractors under each plant, you just need them in the vicinity. But things like your nitrogen fixer, um, you want that, and your pest repellents, you want those right near your, your main plant, um, because they, they just have to be in close proximity to each other. So certain things you want near your plant in a larger food forest system you can have sort of areas of use where you have some areas that are that are more for your mulch plants or your pollinator attractors um, so those uh, that's a really cursory uh, look at some of the tools and techniques we can use in permaculture um, as I said, there, there will be a full day workshop in July, at the end of July, that where we'll get into more detail on, on these and um, hopefully do some practical stuff in person um, at the new Westminster Pond site, but we'll see. We're not sure exactly how it's gonna work yet, if it's gonna be in person or webinar. Um, so that's to be determined. Um, there is for the, um, the person who was asking about the PDC, so um, my colleague Michael Shimp at Three Acre Permaculture has just, um, they've just uh, decided to offer a two week intensive course from August 2nd to the 16th. So there, um, can everybody, Kelsey, can everybody see the questions or is it just you and I that can see the questions? I believe it's just us. Yeah. Okay. Um, so their their website is threeacrepermaculture.com and then they have a page um, for the PDC. So I'll just write that here, Three Acre Permaculture. So that's uh, in August. And that's uh, that gives you your permaculture design certificate. And then um, that gives you a really good solid basis in permaculture to, to go on and, and really apply it. Actually, on that note, I can write that in the um, questions and send it to everybody. So it will, I can do that. Okay. That works. And that's August 2nd to 16th. Uh, and they're just, they're located, located just uh, outside of London, like 40 minutes outside of London. So southwest of here um, and then I'll let Kelsey ex talk about these other upcoming workshops because I uh, <laughs> don't know about them <laughs> sure thank you so uh, yeah okay well thanks so much and um, the next one on Tuesday June, June 30th is with the pollinator pathways project so they're all about um, they create small pollinator gardens um, all over the city to help create and um, help enable pollinators kind of get from one garden to the next um, to help them survive. So uh, certainly another aspect of, of gardening that you may be interested in. So that one is an hour long webinar where they'll be talking about how you can create your own and they'll probably talk about the projects they do as well. Um, I believe they're actually building gardens all along Dundas Street downtown. So they'll even bring pollinators downtown. Um, and then a composting 101 with the Thames Region Ecological Association, or TREE, uh, Wednesday, July 8th. So 
um, it'll be kind of a, a general and um, everything about composting and then of course permaculture the full day more in-depth workshop uh, and we're working on figuring out how we may be able to offer it in person partially <laughs> uh, and then towards the end of July we'll be working with growing chefs to talk about cooking using wild foods so specifically things that usually grow um, in London so in people's yards or in local forests uh, using things that are in season at the time um, and then I'll also just mention briefly the Seeds to Forest Homeschool Edition. Um, so we work with elementary school kids to plant trees in their yards, grow seedlings. They come out to our office to do a field trip. But um, of course, with schools being closed, we've changed it to be uh, offered virtually. So basically on our website, we're offering a lot of um, nature-based activities that can be done by kids of all ages. Um, and some that can be done with parents or some that can just be done on their own. So uh, we're trying to help keep kids busy while they're at home um, and connect with nature. Um, so there's this uh, newsletter we send out every week with more activities and then we always list them on our website. So you can go to reforestlondon.ca for details about that or any of the other Signal Boost events. Um, I'm still working on the details of some of them so you can't sign up to quite all of them yet but the information will be coming soon. Um, yeah, and I think on the last slide, there's my email. So if you ever had questions about it, you can always reach out to signalboost at reforestlondon.ca. Yeah, so that's about it for that. There's been some, a few questions coming in. A few really nice comments too, actually. <laughs> uh, Nan, that you had such cool ideas and she put it in all caps and said, I hope you write a book with these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe one day. I feel like I still have a lot to learn. So I'm still reading other people's books. I guess that's always the way it should be. But How many years of experience have, do you have now doing all, all this stuff between the urban planning and the permaculture? Um, well, I'm, the permaculture, uh, uh when did i 2010 i think 10 years ago is when i took my my pdc and uh and really dived into it but i was i was studying it for a couple of years before i did my my permaculture design course so uh and and applying it to the urban design urban perm, sorry urban planning work that i did um so i guess 12 12 13, well no yeah 13 years yeah, that's awesome. Um, so Kate asked, how does sheet mulch differ from regular mulch? Uh, so while well, regular mulch is just is like wood chips, you can use wood chips, straw, um, uh, leaves, whether they're whether they're chopped up or not. Um, mulch is then kind of ground covering. Um, the, you can even use plastic mulch. Some people, <laughs> I, I stay away from that, but. Um, uh, sheet mulching is is a specific technique to smother what's already growing in situ and replace it with something else. Um, and so you're using layers and you're using top you're topping it off with some sort of mulch like wood chips or um, or leaves or straw. But there's lots of layers underneath and it's a way of kind of reclaiming an area. Um, and on that note, quickly, um, you know there are different if you're purchasing mulch from from a a landscape company or landscape provider that like you can get black mulch or red mulch cedar mulch there's all different kinds um and yet aesthetics you know is more important to some people than others um but if for functionality and pot cost effectiveness i always unless the client really requests something else and is adamant about it um, i just use your standard forest mulch or utility mulch it's the cheapest mulch that those places sell and it's a mix of different um different hardwoods and things it's not um it's got more di the more diversity you have in the mulch with the different species that are in it the more di diversity it'll bring to the soil so um it's better for your pocketbook, but it's also going to be a, actually a better mulch. It's not going to look as pretty maybe, but um, depending on what your needs and yields are for your system, what your biases and sentiments are, um, I would just go with the, the cheapest utility mulch. 
Nice. And a comment that uh, the sheet mulch is a great use for Amazon Prime boxes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, people probably have a lot of those lying around. <laughs> Uh, Lindsay asks, what size of holes do you need to drill for predatory wasps? Uh, well, ag again, diversity is always great. There's lots of different um, species of, of wasps, predatory wasps. So um, usually you want them to be four to six inches deep. Um, and then the, the size of the holes, you can do anywhere from an eighth of an inch to five sixteenths of an inch or three, three to eight eight millimeters and that gives you that'll attract um, or provide opportunities for different um, different species of insects um, you can also buy like you, there's you know there's sort of these bee, bee hotels have become something cool in the last few years um, you could buy mason bee homes um, you can just collect hollow reeds and things with pithy stems um, in the fall and then bundle them up and put them somewhere where they'll stay dry. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of different ways of, of creating that habitat in your yard. And even just not, if you have native plants or you have um, uh, a, a diverse garden, don't chop your stuff down in the fall. Everybody like, people like to do a lot of garden tidy up in the fall, but it's really horrible for your insect populations. So, um, leaving stuff really until the end of May, if you can, um, is, is best because a lot of things will nest in there and, um, or even breaking some of the stems, um, back so that, so that they can be used as nest sites, um, uh, and leaving them laying on the ground so that they're, they're not carried off and put in a composter somewhere or, or put on the curb and taken away. Then you'll, you'll just, there'll be natural homes for, um, for all those insects. That's great. Uh, Charles asks, are there any recommendations for a quality soil at a local retail outlet? I saw he had his hand up too. So Charles, if you want to add anything vocally, just unmute yourself. So recommendations for soil that you can buy at a local retail outlet. Um, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Um, uh, my husband actually has a compost company, the Village Compost. Um, we're not producing our own yet. Hopefully, we will be soon because I get people asking us, "Do we? Do you sell bulk compost?" <laughs> um, the, unfortunately, the compost that you get from landscaping companies is really just leaf leaf mulch. It's what they pick up on the curb, and um, like the, all that stuff gets picked up from the curb uh, uh, by the city and gets turned into leaf mulch. So it's not the most diverse. Um, but you can't really get good quality stuff in bulk um, regionally. So um, in terms of soil, like topsoil, they, the, you know, what, what Fisher Landscape or VNP Landscape has in supply at the time depends on what they've been able to get. Like they just get it when there's new subdivisions going in, they get the topsoil as it's stripped off, they get the topsoil and then they sell it and then they, then they have to sell it back to the developers to, to put back, you know, one, one inch um, or two inches of topsoil once they've built their buildings. Um, but uh, yeah, th those places all have pretty comparable stuff and you can get a two-way mix or a three-way mix um, depending on what your soil is. If you have a, cl a more clay heavy soil, I would go with a three-way mix. If you have a sandier soil, go with a two-way mix. Um, or if you want just compost, you, you can certainly buy their compost in bulk. It, it's better than, than none, but um, it's just leaf mulch. So if you if you have a smaller area, I would get like bags of um, bags of sheet manure or a vermi compost if you can. Actually, vermi compost is great if you you can um, make a compost tea out of it and then sp spread that over a much larger area, and you can get more use out of a, the bag because those are pretty expensive. Vermi compost is pretty expensive to buy a bag of it, but um, you can stretch it out by making it into a tea and then spraying it um, or watering with it instead of using it dry. Great. So then, yeah, you were talking about clay. When dealing with dense clay, what's the best way to break down the clay for planting? Good question. Um, 
organic matter is always going to be your best friend. So the more um, the more you can get organic matter into the soil, the better. Um, and the best way to do that is through roots. So having the plants do the work for you. You can you can chuck in compost and you can you can bring in sand. Um, but um, if you have time, what I've done in some places uh, for some clients, if there's if there is um, you know they're not on a pressing schedule of wanting to use all of their land at once, um, you can use cover crops and stuff like uh, like tillage radish um, or something that's tap rooted, and you can or even you could even I've never done this, but you could seed with dandelions. <laughs> you could get dandelions and burdock and plant them or seed them in your property, um, and they'll they'll get that root down to the clay um, and then chop them back a couple times a year. Every time you chop the top of a plant, the, it sheds the same amount of root. So um, uh, then, it, then it'll grow back. And so pulsing it like that um, is a great way to get lots of, um, lots of root growth. And then, uh, um, but letting it grow tall enough that, that, that the roots are going deep. If you cut them back too frequently, like we do with our turf grass, then the, sh the roots are really shallow. So um, you need to let the plant mature enough that its roots get really deep. Um, but then when you cut the top back, it'll shed the roots as well. And then you have that big plug of organic matter going down into the soil that brings air and water. Um, so yeah, so I have done, I have seeded with like tillage radish before, and then that um, is supposed to winter kill. It doesn't always with our winters anymore, but, um, um, or you can just cut it back and then overseed with something else. Um, adding um, things like clover and stuff too that are more nitrogen fixers will help. Um, and uh, you can, there's mixed recommendations on sand, whether to add sand or not. Um, there are two um, respected plant people that I, um, that I know that do have layered sand, just layered it on top of their clay, and then they let the soil biology bring it up and down, not trying to till it in or mix it, um, but just layering it on top and then letting letting the um, the worms and the, the little critters in there kind of mix it in slowly over time. So um, I haven't tried that myself, um, but I would say you could do that with compost, like add compost on top and let the critters pull that down too. Lots of um, steal the leaves from your neighbors and lay them down thickly in the fall and let them break down by if once you get your soil biology going they'll be you'll see the difference like those leaves will be gone by spring the all the biology there will just gobble them up and turn them into nice healthy soil Oh, a new question just came in. Is there a better time of the year to have a permaculture design consultation with you? So spring, summer, fall, etc. cetera. Um, well, uh, yeah, typically in the, like the fall or winter is a good time um, to start planning for spring. Um, summer is good too, because I don't, I typically don't do planting or recommend doing planting in July and August. So July and August, you know, people always think, say like, oh, winter is the time to dream about your garden and make plans and stuff but I, I think July and August are also good times to dream and plan because it's too hot to do anything the plants don't like being planted in that heat and lack of rain and and stuff either so you know just sit on your lawn chair drink have a sip of something cold to drink and look at your garden and dream and plan for, the, for what you can do in the fall um so summer and Summer and winter are best times. Uh, well, I guess for a design consultation, I have to see it before the snow comes. So fall would, fall is better. Um, and then in, in, in the spring, you can get going with projects. So today's the first day of summer. So I guess uh, you can <laughs> start bombarding her with your calls. <laughs> um, okay. So Kim Lesh asks, would fall leaf waste be good to put into garden beds in fall to prep for the next year's planting? Definitely, yep. And if you have a mulching mower, um, I would uh, like spread it all out on your on your lawn or on your driveway and then just drive over it with your mulching mower and chop it up into smaller pieces. Because um, you can, if it's really, if they're whole leaves and it's really thick, if you put a really thick layer on, they can get kind of matted. 
um, and it's harder for them to break down and harder for water to get through. But if you can mulch them up into smaller pieces, you can put like, you know, six inches on there easily and they'll, they'll just be gone or be like an inch left in, in spring. Um, I should note, stay away from uh, black walnut, no, no black walnut leaves, no, uh, no oak leaves. Um, but that's, yeah, uh, other stuff should be good. It's uh, when you're stealing bags from your neighbors, it's hard to know sometimes what they are, but you can, I usually open them up and have a little look um, and suss out what, the, what species are in there. Oh, a couple of other questions. What's the costing structure of the services that you offer? Oh, um, uh, it varies. The, the lowest point of entry, well, is taking a free webinar with Free Forest London and, and um, learning it yourself. Um, uh, a consultation um, to just come and spend an hour uh, at your property and give you some guidance and then uh, a typed up, typed up recommendations. Um, is $200 and then uh, uh, for a full design plan um, that ranges a lot depending on the size of the property and the complexity um, so that would be I would give you a, a quote on what that would be after we talked about the project um, and uh, or we could I could do hourly rates so um, it's $100 an hour and usually there's a 10 hour retainer to start and then you know, I have clients that I've worked with for five years, like uh, one farmer, she has 150 acres and some years I might do 20 to 30 hours of work with her. And then other years, and she just kind of moves forward with projects. And then I might come in for one or two hours to see what she's done and give her some advice and direction to go from there. Um, so we just kind of have this ongoing relationship and it's just an hourly rate that we set up. Okay, jumping back to the leaves now, uh, what leaves would be good to improve soil acidity in the bed? To improve uh, acidity, like you want the soil to be more acidic? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, oh, then, uh, well, actually, I'm not too sure. Yeah, maybe maybe the person could clarify that. You could unmute yourself and clarify that or just click, because most people don't want their soil to be acidic. The only reason you want your soil to be acidic um, is if you want to plant blueberries or like rhododendrons or something, but um, in my world, blueberries are the only <laughs> blueberries or bunch berries or something, uh, cranberries maybe. But oh yeah, they said yes. Currently have clay alkaline soil. Okay. Um, well, the, the, changing the pH of the soil is very difficult. Uh, the best thing to do is to work with what you have. Um, I mean, it, it can't be too it. Well, it could be, I guess. How alkaline is it? Like, <laughs> if it's still in the range, you know, if it's seven point eight or something, if it's still in the range of seven, then it's it's okay for most for most plants. Um, if you're getting up to eight or beyond, that's that's definitely more of a problem. But um, there will be native plants that can deal with that. And uh, uh, the same with you know, people always want blueberries, and they want you can buy buy blueberry boosters and things that will make the soil acidic um, but it's a it's an ongoing battle it's not working with what you have on site which is a permaculture principle right so try and work with the the pH of your soil um, instead of changing it that's what I would recommend so they said not too alkaline okay yeah if it's just if it's just like a high sevens then that's not a problem for most plants Great. Well, that is it for the questions at the moment. Maybe take we'll take a few more seconds in case anybody wants to add anything. Um, you can also just put your hand up or unmute yourself. But um, otherwise, the contact information is there. I would just like to thank everybody so much for joining us today and for wanting to learn about this. I'm always so happy just to see lots of interest in with all of these different environmental topics and permaculture is such a, a cool way to regenerate the soil, work with improving the ecosystem while also benefiting us by making beautiful spaces and growing food. And there's just so many benefits. So 
um, I hope you all learned quite a bit and are able to apply some of the stuff you learned. So thanks for all these messages coming in. Some people are saying thank you and not a problem. And thanks so much again to Jessica. Uh, and I should definitely add that this event was sponsored by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. <laughs> Great, thanks everybody for joining us on this beautiful morning. And um, now you can go out and do that observation exercise in, in your yard or, uh, or nearby if you don't have your own property yet. Um, and yeah, actually I should add that um, one more thing, there are, if you don't, especially if you don't have your own property, there are some public food forests in London that you can get involved with, um, but really anybody can get involved with them and we need more help with them. So um the the main one that would be uh that's that's really open to the public is called the west lions food forest and it's in um west lions park and where where the kinsman arena is um and every thursday morning they um there's a group that goes there and, and weeds and waters and kind of takes care of things and helps them plants get established so if you're wanting to learn more and um, and get involved in and meet some people in the community, that's a great place to go and um, uh, and uh, soon be able to harvest stuff from there too. So I'll I'll add that uh, a link to that in the in the updated resource page. That's awesome. Thanks. So once again, you can click on those handouts now and download them, but we'll also attach them. Um, with all the added things in an email coming out probably on Monday. All right, well, with that, thanks again. And uh, yeah, like she said, go out and enjoy the day. Oh, another question came in for anyone who's still here. Also your husband's composting business. So someone's asking about uh, that. Sure, it's, it's called Village Compost. He doesn't have a website yet. <laughs> um, but uh, you can you can be, get you can contact him through me. Um, uh, but really, he's he just picks up from commercial properties at the moment. We're not into residential yet. So um, like day daycares, restaurants, um, uh, like um, long care long term care facility things like that. So it's it's more for commercial composting at the minute. At the moment, it gets picked up and then brought to a facility and composted and. Um, Hopefully we'll be we'll eventually get some land and produce compost ourselves, and then we then there will be a place to get bulk good quality compost. Okay, she asked if you could add it to the resource list. I guess at this time it might just be the name. Um, yeah, she's like, yeah. great. So okay, there is a Facebook page that I very loosely manage for him because <laughs> he's not on Facebook. So, but I'll add that to the resource page. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, I think I will stop broadcasting. Once again, you'll get the recording and uh, have a great day.